Well, hello. Okay. Everyone should be able to hear me. Mm. Uh, welcome to this talk on GCC Rust, GCC Rust update, what we've done during the previous year and uh, what we're working at. So, uh, in this talk, we'll talk uh, again about some prerequisites. Um, for uh, I think there's some people that probably don't know Rust that well or simply uh, to, be, to bring some information to you. Um, then I will continue with the upstream status, our GSOC project, uh, the current work that has been done on that is currently done, uh, as well as uh, the future for the project. Okay, so in order for everyone to be on the same page, uh, Rust is a kind of new language uh, created in 2006, um, officially launched in 2009, stabilized in 2015. Um, this CRS is our attempt at making a Rust compiler um, in GCC. Um, we target Rust version uh, 1.49, and um, the project has been uh, restarted in uh, 2019. We're actually targeting uh, version 1.49 because um, it was a version previously used by Rust for Linux. And um, it is the last version of the, um, of the Rust language, which doesn't include many shenanigans with um, all the async runtime and everything. Uh, I mentioned Rust for Linux, so it is a project that is quite well known now. Uh, basically, it allows you to use Rust within the kernel for drivers. So multiple drivers have been entered with Rust. You've got some multiple file system drivers, uh, some GPUs, uh, two GPU drivers, if I, am, if I remember correctly, one unblocked driver, and as well as uh, one unread binder. <coughs> Um, I will talk uh, and mention multiple times during this talk uh, the core library. So in order for you to get an idea about how are things organized, um, when you program in REST, you may use the standard library. And this uh, library has two dependencies, the alloc traits, which basically handles every containers and yes, ba let's say basically a basic container like vector or something, and uh, as well as allocation. And there's the core library, uh, which defines uh, multiple things like language items, basic behaviors, that kind of things. Um, Rust for Linux um, needs the core library, but uh, doesn't use the standard library because the standard library expects some features to already exist. For example, uh, an allocator, that kind of, um, many kind of thing that you don't necessarily have in a kernel, so yes. Um, upstream status. Um, last year, um, I know some of you were at my talk. Uh, I finished uh, the talk with the upstream status and uh, we said that uh, there was some discrepancies within the upstream process, so I will talk about this. Um, so we made it into GC14, which is quite a nice thing. Uh, but we couldn't may, uh, we couldn't um, include the documentation because um, basically after November the top directors has been present and uh, we couldn't include uh, or build a build script for documentation. But uh, that's fine. Um, Sorry, that is specific with the documentation about GCR. No, okay. uh, I'm What is it? Mm. What is this documentation that is not included? What is a document? document. Um, stage one is finished in November. Is that right? Stage one for GCC. Uh, merging patches from which touch uh, added. Uh, you say not documentation. Uh, what is the documentation? The document. Oh, okay. Um, I don't remember the actual content, so I couldn't answer your question. Uh, that was 
basic little things like uh, maybe if, uh, I remember there was some flags and things like this. Uh, uh, where was I? Uh, yes. Um, Okay, and as I said, last year we finished the presentation on one statement that we had uh, almost uh, 800 commits waiting for uh, to be upstreamed, and uh, uh, I'm happy to tell the, this is not the case anymore. <laughs> we've um, we've uh, reduced the gap, and uh, we still we have only 40 commits to upstream, and uh, those commits are not part of the previous 800. So that's just because we got a constant influx of new commits. And uh, yes, we oh, initially we wanted to upstream commits every. Uh, I think last year I told you um, some of you we would upstream every two weeks, but uh, recently we got a lot more of contributors, so um, it makes a lot of commit to eventually clean or thing. And yeah, so um, I don't think we could. Up actually upstream every two weeks it would be too much work but our current rate is mostly fine so i guess most people will agree uh, uh, we could keep like uh, we could uh, continue like this okay um this summer we had three gsoc students for the goal summer of code we had uh, two, one project for each of those students. Uh, first one was uh, inline assembly support by Jasmine Tang. The second one was a uh, test suite adapter for, um, by Mohamed Mahal. And the third one was the borrowing IR location support. <coughs> well, that, that, that inline assembler, is that new extended? Yeah. Yes. Is that new extended inline assembler? So you have, have uh, constraints? Uh, I will give you more details uh, okay, cool. in a few slides, so <laughs> don't worry. Um, <laughs> might ask another question. Um, so the inline assembly was required for Rust for Linux. Um, Rust for Linux make use of an inline assembly, so we needed it for uh, uh, for it and. Um, most of the front-end part is done. That means uh, if you take a look at this uh, snippet, um, we've got um, an assembly statement with uh, uh, a REST syntax. You may have seen that it is not um, quite similar to the C or C++ assembly syntax, so we had to pass actually the uh, format string and uh, uh, then lower it um, within GCC. Um, so all these passing and um, pr um, prior steps are near complete. Uh, I think there's maybe a, missing, a few missing bits, but um, it's uh, almost done. <coughs> um, we had some problems while lowering um, through the compiler. Um, I've put a diff uh, between what um, the May I use this? Yes, should be. Okay, that's fine. Um, on this side, you've got um, uh, both of those diff, uh, uh, both of those patches are from the same um, equivalent syntax in uh, assembly. Um, in red, you've got the one from a C front end. Uh, that gets lowered, and on the right you've got the uh, the one we we had for Rust, and uh, we had some discrepancies, so um, we um, finally managed to fix those, and uh, I mean results are quite similar, so uh, we uh, we are happy with uh, the result of uh, just uh, this JSOC. Um, some work is still required, so we've got we cannot select properly the output registers or input registers. For example, if I want to output any value to let's say EAX in uh, x86, I wouldn't be able to uh, for no um, some limitations. There's also some limitations about the in-out arguments. So uh, let's say you've got um, a variable that is used either as um, 
both as an input and an output on an assembly um, statement. And uh, I guess it doesn't uh, work well. OK. The second JSOC was uh, re the REST-C test suite adapter. Basically, we want to close the gap between REST-C and um, GCCRS. So we, in order to do that, we want to be able to pass the REST-C test suite uh, with GCC. But um, this means um, GCC used DejaGNU. And um, Rust-C use a completely different format, so the work for the student was to provide a tool in order to convert from one format to the other, in order to integrate those tests uh, within the test suite. And um, yes, that's it. Uh, tool is working well. Uh, we've not yet integrated um, uh, tests that pass uh, within our test suite. And, uh, Okay, um, third GSOC project was about the borrow checking IR location support. So, um, to give you an idea, um, um, the borrow checker, we, uh, yes? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, is it better? Okay. Um, yes, it's a lot better. <laughs> Uh, um, oh. <laughs> okay. The uh, uh, as I was saying, the borrow checking IR location spot. Uh, yes. Um, basically, we've got two uh, different systems from Rusty uh, in order to borrow check our code. I won't explain too much into the details because we've got an excellent talk tomorrow uh, about this uh, system. But basically, the um, um, Rusty on the right here. Uh, make use of um, additional uh, inter intermediate representation. Uh, the, um, the, and uh, it directly uh, checks um, the uh, different borrow checking rules within those representation. And we do not have in GCC uh, in the GCC pipeline this kind of uh, intermediate representation. So we had to create a new one and um, um, test for the rule validity over this new representation. Um, if you take a look at one of our tests, um, you may have seen that the GJAGNU directive is um, use the function location for the actual error location, and that's exactly the problem that um, our oh, GSOC student was trying to um, uh, to fix. Uh, basically, um, during borrow checking, the different um, analysis is done within the function, and uh, we had no support for the location within the function. So um, this project allows us to make more useful error messages by um, pinpointing to the exact uh, error line. Okay. Um, no, I will be talking about the different um, uh, different work that we've begun in the last year and that we continue to work until the GC15 and uh, hopefully uh, finish uh, uh, before GC15. Um, uh, so. During the past few years, we've been implementing features. Um, any, we've been implementing the, any kind of features um, upon finding them. So, for example, if we if something wasn't working, we would implement it, and that's it. And this allowed us to cover, let's say, I don't know, eighty percent of the features. But there's a moment where you need. 
to uh, focus on what's remaining and in order to do so you need to know what exactly is missing your compiler. So in order to do this we are to create a list of all missing features in order to compile the core library. And, uh, um, you can find this document actually on the URL uh, in the slide. And um, uh, yes, and the uh, document um, contains a lot of um, uh, all the missing features as well as the experimental features required for um, for compiling the core library. Um, So how did we do? how did we do? So um, initially we thought we could just try to compile it because we thought we had enough features in the compiler, and very quickly we've seen that that is not the case. We were missing a lot of things, and a lot of things began to just break uh, uh, everywhere. So we basically had to strip down the library of, um, for every feature that was not working. We would completely remove the um, what, what was concerned with feature within a library. So this meant we had to, for example, let's say we are, let's say uh, it's an example, but let's say we do not support functions, we had to remove all functions until it compiles properly. And um, uh, this left us with um, uh, some shoe code that was working, and that, uh, that was quite cool. But uh, when removing those things, we were uh, putting those aside and we noted everything. So here are the different things that were not working. The name resolution was broken. Um, I will give some details in, uh, in a few slides. The parser was incomplete on some experimental features. Uh, we were missing some built-in macros, and there was some uh, language item support that was uh, missing. And um, I will uh, give more details on um, the last statement, but uh, it's quite funny. So name resolution rework, why, um, what we did and why we did it. Um, Basically, the all resolution algorithm has been made a few years ago and was probably um, made uh, in an uh, with an iterative manner. Uh, people probably didn't look too much into details and documentation or those kind of things because some basic rules were broken and uh, the code var was very fragile. So, uh, yes, for example, um, in Rust, you've got four uh, four kind of namespaces for uh, for names. So then you've got one namespace for values, one for macros, one for types, and one for labels. Um, in this snippet, I've put, I've put three um, three identically named items, and uh, all of those have name uh, have the same name, but all of those are in different namespace. So Rust is uh, is cool with that. Um, the previous name resolution algorithm uh, merged two of those namespaces, so it just couldn't work. And you got some other funny things, basically, as um, in other languages, you could import a lot of items into scopes, you could also alias them. and. Um, what is quite tricky is that you can also re-export those items from within a scope. So, um, last thing, uh, you can also glob onto multiple items from a scope, but um, you should not emit an error because um, in case there is already an item that has been imported. So, some items might shadow others uh, depending on some rules. So, it is quite tricky to get right. Um, last but not least, um, the macros can expand into other macros or can expand into other micro calls. So this means um, we have to completely change the algorithm to the fixed uh, fixed point. So this means the algorithm will uh, try to expand code until uh, the AST doesn't uh, change. 
Um, in order for this new name resolution, we use try-like structure. So if you ever use dictionaries or things like this, um, you you may be familiar with that kind of um, structure. Um, and uh, as I said, um, there's multiple uh, multiple steps into uh, the new um, algorithm. Um, so, uh, first step is the actually the previous step of the compiler, so that's the config stripping. So basically, re removing every code that has been disabled, um, like you would have in C uh, with a define flag, for example. If um, if something is defi is defined, you include it; otherwise, you you just throw it. So um, then you've got the top level. Um, resolution. It will basically cover every definition, so structures, traits, as well as um, macros. And um, uh, yes, uh, it will just cover in your RST all those items, and uh, uh, it will save them into our tree-like structure. Um, then you've got the early uh, name resolution. Um, early name resolution will uh, basically um, try to discover every macro invocation within your your code or yes. And uh, when both of those uh, steps have been done, you need to actually imp uh, expand all those macros you've discovered and um, begin again a loop if you um, if your AST has, uh, has changed. Um, I've put an example here with um, three macro within each other. So the first two are quite easy to see because uh, that's two macro rules. But the third one is on um, on the function. You've got an attribute on uh, on the function. So this means we, uh, there's at least three loops within the uh, expander. So it was, uh, we um, first the outer macro is expanded, then the inner macro is expanded, then the uh, uh, Macro called Hanover macro is uh, expand what is needed, required for a function. <coughs> uh, we've had a bit of parser issues. Uh, most of those issues were not really. Um, important. This was mainly uh, due to uh, exper experimental features. Uh, basically, um, every REST compiler makes use of two sets of features, stable ones that are meant to stay, and experimental ones. But experimental ones are used within the compiler to test those features, so we need them for REST for Linux and uh, compiling core. And uh, yeah, we had some funny um, uh, funny behaviors like, um, for example, attributes uh, on generic arguments. We were also missing language items. So language items um, can be extended within the library. So core extend many li uh, language item and it gives them a location. Um, uh, it's a fun system because it allows you to specify new behaviors to language items. And um, uh, yes, um, uh, those, uh, those new definitions constitute part of the core library. So um, yeah, we we need them in order to compile the core library. <coughs> um, this attempt at compiling the core library was our first real attempt uh, at compiling real code. Um, before that, we were compiling a few functions at, at most or test, uh, test cases, but there, were, there wasn't um, any big project or anything that we, uh, we've attempted to compile. So it was kind of a real uh, first time. Um, so. 
we try to compile uh, around 700 lines um, that contain a lot of macros. So keep in mind that those um, uh, it could expand to maybe let's say 2,000 lines in, in total. Mm. Our build was not optimized, so it's my, it might be it. But uh, yeah, the performances were quite awful. We had multiple seconds for just that kind of, uh, of file. Um, Rust, even within Rust, is known as slow to compile, but not that slow. So yes, it is slightly worrying, but because we didn't expect um, uh, our compiler to be that slow. But uh, it is not a priority because um, we need to make correct compiler before attempting any optimization or anything. Uh, yes, as Knut said, uh, optimization is root of all evil. So let's not focus uh, on that for now. Um, let's talk about future work. So, okay. oops. Um, so what's next uh, to do? We we want to continue name a resolver uh, to replace it. Uh, we will basically uh, we have set up a flag to basically enable or disable it uh, whenever we want, and we um, we want to um, um, to replace it within within all our test cases, uh, and when all our test cases will be figured. Uh, at least uh, when all pass, uh, we want to replace our default name resolver with a new one. Uh, we want to add a missing language item and we want to iterate over this same methodology. So basically, uh, attempt to compile the core library, uh, find new bugs, find new, um, new breakage, and um, repeat. Okay, in the long run, we want once we in the long run we want to compile the core library. We want without modifying any bit of it, and uh, we want to catch up with Rust for Linux. So this means implementing multiple uh, uh, features that are missing that uh, that appeared in uh, in your uh, newer Rust version. Uh, it is not too worrying because. Uh, many of those features were in experimental state uh, from a, a long, for a long period, so we may have already implemented most of those features already in compiler uh, as experimental, experimental features. So, yes. Um, uh, when it is done, we want to try to co compile the standard library. I mean, uh, yes, and uh, we need to ensure the soundness. We already have a student that um, a contributor uh, that um, uh, tries to um, compare the, uh, the difference between semantic uh, between the assembly produced by Rust and our assembly. Um, finally, in a very long run, uh, we want to close the gap reversely, but uh, yeah, it'll be quite a few years before uh, reaching that goal. Um, so it was quite uh, interesting because <laughs> I went very fast. Uh, I hope you have got questions because, uh, <laughs> yeah, we are still have uh, half an hour in front of us. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. So you were talking about the uh, Rust component as a dependency to GCC. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. 
Um, basically, we want to reuse Polonius because because it is quite a big project, and we do not have enough people to um, to go the correct borrow checker uh, all along. Uh, Jakub might talk about uh, that uh, tomorrow, but uh, yes, let's say we didn't want to recall all um, all the borrow checker because it is. Um, a huge code base and it is quite difficult. We, we could not make any mistake. And libformat was used as a first step toward um, getting Polonius within the uh, GCRS. So basically, for now, we use Rust-C to compile um, uh, Polonius or libformat. Uh, we, uh, we got some bindings to, in order to be able to call uh, Polonius or libformat from within GCC. And uh, we will be able to, um, um, yes, sorry, uh, we will be able to uh, compile some Rust code, and uh, later uh, down the line we will we should be able to compile Polon uh, Polonius ourselves. So uh, the, the complete build of GCC at this time will be probably in two stages. Uh, I'm. It is already in multiple stages, but we pro will probably add another stage. One uh, where um, GCC will build um, itself without the safety checks from the from Polonius and everything. And once it is able to compile um, a Rust code, it will recompile itself with those components missing. And uh, yeah, does it answer your question? Yeah, so so I was basically uh, making you to try guess a timeline. So when you are able to build libcore, is that basically enough to also build Polonius and libformat, or is there much more features missing? So so when when you are talking about building libcore, that's probably not GCC 15, right? Um, more like GCC 16. So is that also the point where you will be able to build Polonius, or is that completely unknown when that's going to work? So your question is, uh, you're asking whether we have more REST components that are coming within the GCC? Is that right? No, I'm basically asking for if there are any guesstimates for timelines. So oh, GCC any estimate for the GCC complete bootstrap? Yeah. Yes, uh, no. <laughs> um, we, you know, to do that, we need to have a complete compiler, and for now, uh, it is not the case. We, uh, to compile Polonius, we need a standard library. So if we take a look at the slide, this one? Yes. Uh, this means we will be able to compile Rust for Linux before uh, doing that. And, um, Actually, we might not need um, Rust 1.78. Uh, I don't remember the exact version, um, minimum required version for Polonius, but it might be lower. But yes, we need a standard library, and uh, we, we, we need a lot of things uh, before being able to compile Polonius ourselves and uh, make this process. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, do you have another question? Um, a couple of questions about the test suite. So, are you writing all of the tests from scratch? Or are you also porting tests over from Rusty? Uh, I'm sorry. Am I writing what? Uh, for the for the test suite, um, are you porting tests from Rust C test suite or, or the Rust test suite over to GCC? Yes. So, uh, you were mentioning the. Tool I've uh, uh, where was it from our GSOC tenants? That's right. Um, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. So I think that maybe answers the question. So do you do you have some sort of automated way of? Converting Rust C tests yes, into yes, that, that's uh, actually the ah, project of the yeah. uh, student. Um, in case it wasn't clear, so um, the student uh, is working on a project that is an automated tool to convert uh, 
all Rust cases. Um, take, for example, the error message, expected error message, put it back within DJAC new format, and uh, in order for us to be able to to use uh, those DJAC new tests uh, within our within our test suite. Cool. Uh, and the other one was uh, you mentioned about the slow compile time. What What's the impact on running the test suite? How long does the test suite take to run? The maximum run times? Uh, how long does it take to run the tests? So, uh, so if you run regression tests, how long does that? Oh, take? if we build a GCC with um, some uh, optimization flag? Um, if you so suppose you just want to regression test a patch, um, how long does it, does it take to run all of the tests? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, haven't made, I haven't made many attempts, mainly because it was already quite long and quite disheartening to see the compiler performing so poorly. So yeah. we've just uh, we we just think that it it performed poorly um, on performances, and uh, we we weren't. Uh, it was not our focus, so we didn't focus on that. No, I, I just thought. If, if that's prohibitively slow, then you might start caring more about the the compile the compile time. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll talk about it more later. I think there was a question. Okay. Did you have a question? Oh, maybe uh, I'm not familiar with the Rust test suite or with the AIDA ACATS test suite, but they they wrap their test their their test runs, so maybe you don't need to convert it, or that's maybe what you. You don't do. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear anything. Okay, so you want to run the Rust C test suit, yes. which has a different um, format for um, yes for the DG <laughs> yes uh, corresponding thing. But do you actually need to convert it, or could you just translate it when we you run? we only need to convert the. I'll say it. We, uh, within a test, you've got those kind of. Uh, I had a test somewhere. Um, um, yeah, within a test, you've got a Dijagnu directive, at least for Dijagnu. And for C, it is mostly the same. They've got some directives uh, that act like metadata that describe how the test is run, uh, what is the expected results, and that kind of thing. Um, we don't touch at the code itself. We only, we only, uh, the tool, we only try to get those kind of metadata and uh, convert right. them. The, in, the, the Rust test suite doesn't have a DGR or error messages inside, right? So, or is this actually an example from their test suite? No, 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 that's from DJAC so that's, yeah, that's right. our yeah, test suite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they have some other representation of, of this should be an error here. So can you just translate that on the fly? Uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, I already have a problem here. Oh, we, we can talk about it later. Okay. We can take that on. Right. Um, one problem is that the exact error messages of Rust C versus GCC Rust are different. So that's why you cannot directly use, or one of the reasons why you cannot directly use the original Rust C test cases, but there has to be some translation or whatever between the two. Um, they are inherently different, well, yeah, I guess we could align them in some way, but that was not a goal. Um, that's not highest priority because Rust has this concept of error codes, so every error message comes with a unique code um, which classifies the error, and GCC Rust um, uh, um, wants to emit the same code, so what this translation tool does is uh, emit the DJ error with any kind of message, but um, it has to contain the, the error code. So that's one thing this, this tool does. Yeah, one thing in the GCC uh, Rust test suite is that they directly test the whole uh, output, just like a file. 
and they have quite advanced like hints showing you where precisely the error happened and what is wrong there. And it will take us a long time to get to that level of diagnostics. So the idea is to extract just the basic information and make sure that we match the same error. I, I guess this ADA test suit as you, that you mentioned um, is just, a, or just, I mean, it's a great test suit, obviously, but it's uh, execution tests, um, and then you can easily check whether the test succeeded or not. But it does not contain um, checks for compiler diagnostics, as far as I remember. No other question? Well, okay, uh, that was it then. <laughs>